Uh, perhaps before we get started formally, if you've got a phone and it's not on silent or turned off, let me encourage you to do that now. If you'd like to have a seat, there are some seats down. I know no one wants to sit at the front, but there are some seats at the front if you'd like to uh, take a seat. Well, let me welcome you here today. My name is Marty Davis. I'm the uh, minister from the Anglican Church at Sussex Inlet. Uh, it's my privilege to take this service today. We have gathered here today to mourn a relative to honour a departed friend, to show sympathy uh, with those who grieve, and there's a great sign of support here today from the community, and of course to deal reverently with the mortal body. Today as we meet, we do remember that life is a precious gift from God. We mark the life of Suzanne Mary Therese Turnbull. Uh, Sue was born on the 5th of December 1947 to Morris and Claire, McKinnon. Uh, she was one of seven children, uh, survived now only by Tonya and Kate. Oh, and Morris. My, my apologies. He's here. He can speak for himself. Sorry, Morris. Sorry, that's the first time I've been corrected in one of these. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, Sue and John met at the uh, Aladala Bowling Club uh, many years ago. Uh, the city girl and the country boy. Uh, they were married at St Mary's in Milton on the 20th of April 1968. Uh, they had three children, Donna, Melissa and Megan. And Sue departed this life on the 25th of October, aged 75. And so today we pay our respects. Uh, we celebrate Sue's life. I, I dare say there'll be a tear or two shed. Uh, and of course we say farewell. And perhaps uncomfortably today reminds us of the certainty of death. It's not something that we can escape. And we will each have to give an account to God, our maker, our judge for our lives. So with that thought in mind, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. God, our Father, you alone are holy. We ask that you would forgive us for all our sins and failures. We pray at this time that you would uphold us by the power of your spirit. Enable us to show your compassion. And we do ask that in our sorrow, your peace would override. And may our grief give way to joy. And we pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I do want to remind us, though, that in the midst of death, we don't have to live as people without hope. Uh, I want to remind us of the promise that God holds out to those who, uh, who trust him. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. We're going to uh, hear some stories about Sue's life. Uh, first of all, Ross and Beth are going to come up and, uh, and share with us. Well, Johnny, you're buggered. Um, Sue didn't look after the chooks or the cattle or the homebrew, but she did everything else. Susie, what's for lunch? It's in the fridge, John. Susie, where's my stubby holder? It's on the table beside your chair, John. Susie, what clothes am I putting on? They're on the bed, John. Yeah. Sue was born at Concord, and she's third eldest of seven 
children, six girls and a boy. She went to the primary school at St Dominic's Primary in Flemington and then St Mary's Commercial, Commercial College at Concord. Then after leaving school, she worked at the deli in Concord. Croydon. Croydon, sorry. <laughs> Sue wasn't always the lovely lady that we all knew and loved. She used to be a beautiful, young, innocent girl. Well, Johnny soon changed that. <laughs> Most young couples start out by courting with the bloke picking up the girl in his car and go out for the night. Well, Johnny did his courting in Don Davis's cattle truck. <laughs> As Sue said, live, said Sue lived in, uh, near Homebush in Sydney and one of Johnny's jobs while working for Don Davis was to pick up cattle and lambs out of Homebush sale yards for Ted Ladder and Don Affleck's abattoirs. Now there were no mobile phones back then but Johnny used to try and park the truck quietly out the front of Sue's parents home in the middle of the night but the trees up against the cattle crate used to alert Sue that he had arrived but unfortunately it also alerted Sue's parents and the neighbours and everyone else around. Well, they were married, but they had no home. So Sue came to live with us at Woodlawn, at Woodstock Road. Now, some of us thought we did it a bit tough when we first got married and sort of rented different little places and carried on. But spare a thought for poor young Sue, having grown up in the city with neighbours on all sides, girlfriends just down the street, shops within walking distance, and five sisters and a brother. To then come to the, a dairy farm in Milton, where she knew no one, didn't have a car, couldn't drive anyway, but on top of that, to live with your in-laws. <laughs> as well as falling pregnant and having morning sickness and Johnny away working in the cattle truck all week and a lot of weekends, typically, leave, typically leaving of a morning to pick up a load at, locally and ending up at Yass and getting home two days later. Well, after eight months of this, they bought their first home in Deering Street, where soon, Sue soon turned that house into a home. I'll let Beth continue the story from here on. Susan Mary McKernan Turnbull, also known as Susie Doozy Fred Dahl, John's favourite, and no doubt a few more. But to me, she was always Sue. I met Sue the night she and John were married 55 years ago. John introduced me as another cousin and something just clicked with us. Sue said, we'll have to catch up. Well, catch up we did and then catch up some more. Not long after that, they moved to 23 Deering Street and I lived around the corner on the highway. 22? 82. 82. Oh, sorry, me. John said 23. 82. That was Drive. Oh, Stanton Drive. And I was around the corner on the highway, and it was just a quick walk, and I was there. I was only 16 at the time, but our friendship, strong from the start. It wasn't long before Donna arrived, and I loved having her around. I was there to babysit if Sue and John needed me. Bob and Rhonda lived around the next street and about nine months after Donna was born, Grant arrived, so adding to the next generation of Turnbull cousins. Melissa and Megan then arrived and their family was complete. Sue, coming from the big smoke, realised early on that she would need her licence to get around. Not much public transport in Ulladulla. She, she did that in the trusty white HR Holden. So then we had wheels. <laughs> I remember on one occasion we were off to Sydney. 
not sure what for, but to see Sue's family. Back then it was such a long, long way. She would pack the car with the wooden spoon between the two front seats, took pride of place between the two front seats. Well, serenity lasted till about yatter. <laughs> and then it would be on. The noise from the back seat was unbelievable, but we still managed to talk over the top of it. It was worth it, and we enjoyed our few days catching up with Sue's family. In later years, Sue did get to spend time with her family, able to visit any time she wished. Kath and Sue would go on great holidays, especially to visit Megan when she lived in the Canary Islands. Sue and John would also spend time in Darwin or wherever those three girls might be. Sue made friends easily, and with John's football mates, there were parties at each other's houses regularly. Sue loved a party. The shed up the back of Deering Street was party central for both Sue and John and the girls. Lots of great memories there. One party in particular was my surprise 40th in the shed. And I've never understood how she pulled that one off uh, with me. Our friendship grew and we spent a lot of time together. I remember I came to visit with my own special news. Sue told Donna, I think she was about nine at the time, I was having a baby of my own. Well, she put her hands on her hip and said there'd be no need for that, she's got us. <laughs> the girls then went, they loved Adam and then Dean, but Donna also loved going out to sea with Bert in his shark cat, sitting right up the front, so dangerous, but don't tell mum, she would say. All through those early years, Sue, Sue worked hard. Fruit shop, BBC, cleaning, etc., whatever job was there. But she took so much pride in everything she did. Her work ethic, her home, her family, but most importantly, herself. She was, she was very proud of her girls. Donna seemed to fly well above the radar. I always felt she was wise beyond her years. Megan, after watching the elder two, was able to talk her way out of it, out of anything, <laughs> just flew right under the radar, but not our Melissa. She would fly smack bang right in the middle of it every time. Sue and I, Sue and I were lucky to work together at the laundromat. And if the phone rang, would ring around lunchtime, Sue would shake her head and say, that'll be the school. <laughs> What's she done now? John always said we were the only two people he knew that could work together every day for eight or nine hours and then have to ring each other that night because we'd forgot to tell each other something. <laughs> Just lucky, I guess. After working together for those years, we both worked different jobs and had our own families, but she still found time for me. She was my rock, and on many occasions there were things we shared that meant so much to me and I'll never forget them. We managed to get through raising our kids, then came the grandchildren, another level of love. We shared their ups and downs, another good reason to catch up. She was always interested in everything they were doing as well as the rest of the family. She could talk about them, but if anyone else did, look out. A couple of Sue's one-liners were, who would have told them that? And how would they know that? She was so very proud of the adults they become. But step aside, children and grandchildren, because here come the great-grandchildren. <laughs> Those three boys brought so much pleasure to Sue's life. Charlie pointed out only the other day, and rightly so, we weren't even allowed to have a ball inside, <laughs> just as Louis did his eighth lap around the billiard table in the house on his balance bike. How, my, how age can mellow us. Early on, Zelma taught Sue to crochet, and her work is amazing. Anything to it, Sue attempted was a showstopper. About eight years ago, Coral asked her to show her how to do a tea towel. Sue said, yes, she would, and told me she may as well show me too. 
my thought, first thought was, well, good luck with that. So our Tuesday group started and how much fun we have had. I think there is more talking than anything else, but we love it. And after all that time, the rest of us are still struggling to start a granny square. <laughs> there is one chair at our table that will never be, we will never be able to fill. Sue certainly had her share of grief and loss over the years, but nothing hit her quite as hard as the loss of her beautiful firstborn Donna. In the past 12 months, I felt a little piece of Sue went with her. Those little boys put a small spark back in her life, and I'm so grateful for that. There is so much I could say, and if I could wish for one thing, it would be for another 55 years with Sue. And even at the end of that, we would still have something to talk about and to catch up with. I found this verse in my mum's little book, and I felt it was meant for my best friend Sue. It said, along the path of life, thanks be to God you came our way. Remembrance is a keepsake. So until we catch up again, Sue, may you rest in peace, my friend. Done good, Ross. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Beth. Thanks for saving me from being the only one corrected this morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, I believe we've got some of the grandkids who are going to come and uh, bring us a few, few of their thoughts and memories as well. Is it on? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Nana's eight grandkids and three great grandkids, and I think we can all agree we hit the jackpot with her. <laughs> Up until last week, we never imagined a world with Nen not in it. Not only did we lose a Nen, the queen of our family, we also lost our best friend. <laughs> Nen was always there. The teachers had to make a famous sausage rolls and caramel slice to supply the households with crocheted blankets. And most importantly, she was there for us. If we ever needed someone to talk to, keep us company for the day, we knew Nen was there. We did everything with Nen. It, felt, it never felt like Nen was 50 years older than us. She just felt like another friend. I'll never forget our fake tan phase we went through <laughs> about five years ago, where we'd both strip down naked <laughs> and tan one another in the shed and hope Pop didn't walk in. <laughs> we have a lifetime of memories to cherish when we were made to hide the evidence of Nen's shopping addiction <laughs> before she took her newest purchase shoes into the house so Pop didn't find out. Even last week, she bought a new pair of shoes, but before taking them home, she stopped by Mum's and dumped the box in her bin. <laughs> when, and when Pop asks if she's gone out to get something new, she goes, I've had this for years, John. <laughs> You're always told grandkids are spoiled and loved by grandparents, but great grandkids are a whole other level. And then finally got her three boys 50 years later. And when Tarek was born, she renamed herself to Granny. As kids, we were barely allowed to make noise inside the house without being told off. But as soon as the great grandkids arrived, that got thrown out the window. They were allowed to ride push bikes inside and use the house as a sporting field. Our three boys were cut short of a relationship with their Granny, but they will cherish the years they have had being loved and spoilt by her, and we will never let them forget her. What would do for one last slap on the shoulder, pinch on the bum, or a late night phone call when she's had one too many of Pop's home brews and had the giggles? <coughs> well, we miss you so much, Nan, we'll love you forever. <coughs> <laughs> Uh, 
We've got two uh, final people who are going to uh, speak. Kiz McAdams is going to come and say a few words, and then uh, Zoe is going to come and read a poem for us, I believe. Susie Q, I have so many things that I'd like to say. From the first time I came to your house, I felt like I had walked into my own home. You and John both made me feel like I was one of the family. The camping trip to Blue Gum many years ago now, we arrived for the weekend to share the site with the nudist camp, <laughs> and many giggles were shared with us girls, and it was the start of many more fun memories to be made over the next 40 years. The Catherine Gorge sunset dinner was spectacular and I'm so ever grateful that I got to do that with you, Melissa and Carls. Melissa, Jackie and myself, the three musketeers, we got up to some mischief in our earlier years. I remember Melissa's 21st. Us girls decided we would have some early shots, which we had out of plastic egg cups. <laughs> Sue tried to give us glass ones, but we didn't want to break them. I proceeded to get legless and left before the speeches even started. You ring my mum and Barry Sue's and they promptly pick me up, but you always welcome me back. I could go on forever with all of the beautiful memories I have made with you all over the years. I feel extremely honoured to not only have known you, Susie, but to have spent so many wonderful years growing up with your family. I'd like to send my condolences and love to you, John, Melissa, Megs, and all the family. I have the most beautiful memories that I will treasure forever. Rest in peace, Susie. I love you. God's garden. God looked around his garden and he found an empty place. And then he looked up upon the earth and saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. He knew that you were suffering. He knew you were in pain. He knew you would never get well on earth again. He saw a road was getting rough and the hills were hard to climb, so he closed your weary eyelids and whispered, peace be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone, for part of us went with you the day God called you home. And now we're going to watch a photo tribute with some music that the family's chosen.
For all those times you stood by me For all the truth that you made me see For all the joy you brought to my life For all the wrong that you made right For every dream you made come true Let me lead us in prayer. Merciful God, Father, Creator and Lord of life, we thank you that you've made us in your image. 
Uh, and as we've just been reminded, that you've invested our lives with significance, meaning and worth. And we do pray that you would help us to value the lives that you've given us and help us also to live our lives rightly before you and before one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. I'm going to uh, read this morning from uh, Psalm 23. It'll be a psalm that's known uh, to many of you. Uh, There the psalmist writes, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I see I've got competition here. (laughs) I guess if you let them ride around the pool table, where's it going to lead? When Sue married John, things changed, and and Ross gave us a bit of a picture of that earlier on, Uh, perhaps especially for Sue. Uh, Here is the city girl now living in the country, away from the bright lights, uh, away from the hustle and bustle, I imagine miles from anywhere may have been something that went through her her mind from time to time. Uh, And of course at times we do look forward to the excitement of the city. Uh, I moved out of Sydney about 16 years ago. Can't say I'm terribly clean to go back there, but a little hit every now and then is okay. Um, And I imagine for uh, for Sue, certainly lots lots of things to do, lots of places to go. But of course, at other times, we, uh, we appreciate that escape from the hustle and bustle of the city and, uh, and the peace and the serenity that the countryside offers. And in a sense, that's a bit of the appeal of Psalm 23, as we have that picture of the sheep led by the still waters as they feed and rest in those uh, lush green pastures. And the picture of a shepherd who takes care of their needs. Uh, God is the good shepherd that's pictured in the psalm. And God, as the good shepherd, is concerned for our best. Uh, The Bible doesn't have a great sort of, uh, I guess, assessment of us at times. We are loved by God and cherished by God. But it also is real about our faults, our failures and our weaknesses. And we are likened to sheep. Uh, Isaiah 53 says, we like sheep have gone astray. Now, I don't know if you had many sheep on the, on the property out here, certainly a few cattle from the sounds of it. Uh, sheep are vulnerable, uh, they're easily spooked, and they do wander off. They, they follow the leader blindly. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Uh, we want independence, we want autonomy. Uh, we, at times, reject God's good plan for us. And go in our own direction. We are like sheep that get lost. Uh, on one occasion, Jesus told a story about a man who had lost a sheep. Uh, the great thing about the story, for him, it wasn't simply one amongst thousands, a nameless fleece, but a sheep that was precious to him. Uh, it probably had a name. And the shepherd made every effort to find the sheep that had got lost. And having found it, he was overjoyed, put it on his shoulders and celebrated with his friends when he arrived back home. Jesus then follows that story with a second story about a woman who had lost one of her uh, ten valuable silver coins. They were her security, they were her, if you like, her superannuation plan, they were her, her, uh, her savings for her old age. And when she lost it, she swept the house, she cleared everything. And again, having found the coin, she celebrated with her friends. And at the end of both those stories, Jesus finishes with this idea, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 
And then in the third story, Jesus touches on uh, the most precious thing of all. And we've seen that reflected here today as we've seen the importance of family. But in the third story, a father loses his son. Uh, not to death, not, not to, uh, to, to illness, but to poor choices. It's a dramatic story. It's an arresting story because the son, before time, actually demands his father's inheritance. Uh, he then left. He went to a faraway land. He wasted the money that his father had spent so many years working to accrue. In a sense, he rejected everything that his father stood for and was almost as though he was saying to him, you are dead to me. Waste, having wasted his inheritance through reckless living and bad choices, the son uh, hit rock bottom. And as he's feeding the pigs, he thinks to himself, what am I doing here? How did I get here? And we might wonder, what was the father doing at this stage? Uh, had he washed his hands of his son, this son who'd been so disrespectful towards him? One suspects that every day the father was at the gate looking down the road, longing for that day when his son would actually return to him. And one day that happens. Our father sees the son from a distance, he drops everything and he runs to embrace his son. One bit of the story that perhaps is lost on us in our culture is in Middle Eastern culture uh, where this story was told, middle-aged men don't run. It's kind of beneath their station in life. Uh, if you can think back to Queen Elizabeth, could you imagine her running? Probably not. P perhaps gives us something of, a, of the idea here. But this man dropped everything, dropped all those ideas, uh, all those standards that uh, their society had. He, he abandoned those rules and he ran down the road to embrace this lost son. And at that point, the son launches into a speech. It had been a long trip home. I imagine he'd rehearsed the speech in his head many, many times, and he said to his father, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He knows that his sins are many, uh, he is remorseful, he is repentant, and his father embraces him. Now sometimes in life there will be things that we lose that we never find, uh, sometimes there will be things that we find and we'll be ecstatic when we've, uh, when we've found them. They bounce, don't they? <laughs> Jesus' story alerts us all that at one time or another we are lost to God. We are like sheep that stray. Uh, like the sun we make defiant and reckless choices. But Jesus says there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So today we are here, uh, we're in a church, we are reminded about life and death. Uh, perhaps a good time to take stock of what is important to us and to remember those things that matter the most. And it's a good time, I think, to ask the God questions. And I want to simply remind us this morning about Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who came to seek and to save the lost, who came to lay down his life for our sin, that we might find forgiveness and acceptance with God. Because we don't need to stay lost. And in these difficult times especially, we can turn to him for the help and the support that he offers. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Uh, we're going to give thanks to God for the lives that he's given us. We're going to thank God for uh, what Sue has brought to those lives. And we're going to pray for strength and comfort for those who grieve. So would you bow your heads with me? Uh, now I think we have the Lord's Prayer on our orders of service. Is that right? Yes, we do. Uh, on the inside. And at the end of... Uh, me leading you in prayer, I'll invite those who are comfortable to, uh, to say the Lord's Prayer uh, with me. So let me, let me lead us in prayer. Almighty God, we do give you thanks for the gift of life. And today we are thankful for Sue's life and for all she contributed to those who knew her. 
We give thanks for Sue's dedication to her family, for her love, care and provision for John and Donna, Melissa and Megan, and in time, uh, their extended families. We give thanks for Sue's love, dedication and hard work. And we are thankful for the way she invested time and energy in the lives of her children and uh, how over time uh, she took great delight in her grandchildren, and especially her great-grandchildren. We give thanks for her generosity, her faithfulness, her friendship towards family and friends. And Lord God, we do ask that you'd help us each to cherish the lives that you've given us. Help us to live our lives rightly before you. Amen. And Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, we do pray that you would deal graciously with those who mourn. And we commend to you Sue's family and friends. We think especially of John and his loss after so many years together. We pray for Donna's family, uh, for Martin, Tilly and Zoe. For Melissa and Brett, Laura, Kaylee and Kelvin and their extended family. For Megan and Stuart, Madison, Charlie and Jet. We also pray for Sue's surviving siblings, for Tonya, Kate and Morris. And other extended family members who were close to Sue. We pray also for friends both near and far. That you would heal the ache that they feel. And for all who feel the pain of Sue's passing, we ask that they may cast their cares on you and know the consolation of your love and the strength of your peace. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Father God, we pray, help us to understand and receive your purposes for our lives, to hear the good news about Jesus who laid down his life for us so that we might find light in our darkness, strength in our grief, and hope and comfort in your saving words. Amen. And uh, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Psalm 103 reminds us of the frailty of life, but also of God's goodness. It says, The Lord is full of compassion and mercy slow to anger and of great goodness. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender towards those who revere him. For he knows of what we are made. He remembers that we are but dust, flourishing like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it's gone, and its place it will know no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever and ever towards those who revere him and his righteousness upon their children's children. And as we conclude uh, this time here in the church, let me say a couple more prayers. Eternal Father, God of all consolation, in your unending love and mercy for us, you turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life. Be our refuge and strength in sorrow. As your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by dying for us, conquered death, and by rising again, restores life, so may we go forward in faith to meet him. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And this uh, blessing... 
from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Uh, let me invite you uh, to a couple of things. Uh, if you wish to join the family at the graveside burial, uh, then please do that and uh, I follow the, uh, the cars. Uh, if instead you would prefer just to go straight uh, to the bowling club, there will be some refreshments, an opportunity to uh, have a drink, share some stories, shed a tear, have a laugh, I imagine, and, uh, and say hello to one another. So that's at Ulla Dulla Bowling Club. Uh, let me invite you to stand. And we're going to have uh, the family lead the casket out of the uh, church. I can't begin to know him, but then I know it's growing strong. Wasn't the spring, and spring became the summer. Who'd have believed you'd come along? Hey. Touching hands, reaching out, touching me, touching you. Reaching out, touching. 